presentation started and first of all I just want to welcome everybody. I see we have a, a nice group of attendees and uh, for our uh, fall warbler identification. A um, little bit of housekeeping here. First of all let me introduce myself. I'm Nancy Howell. I'm one of the board members with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Uh, Betsy O'Hagan will be our audio and video engineer. So she'll be using um, some different techniques and getting things up. Uh, Ryan Jacob will be joining us here shortly. He's there waving to us. Uh, do you want to mention that uh, Betsy has the power to mute everyone because we, you know, as people check in sometimes uh, there's background sound so Betsy will try her best to keep things muted. Uh, if you have questions that you'd like to ask if you look at the very bottom, there's a bar, at least on my computer, that says chat. Uh, click on that. You can type in your question. I will pass that question on to our presenter. Or if anybody has questions about Western Cuyahoga Audubon, we can answer those as well. So we want to we want to get through a lot of information this evening. And this is just a small part of our Fall Warbler Challenge. Uh, for the month of September through October. So it started actually September 1st, but that doesn't matter. You can start any time to look for fall warblers uh, on this challenge. There's information on the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website. There's a really nice big button that says Fall Warbler Challenge. Bingo. You hit that, you register for the challenge, uh, go out uh, and follow the rules. Um, you can go anywhere in the county in which you live. So if you live in Cuyahoga County, you can go anywhere. Uh, if you live in Medina County, anywhere in that county. So again, just you have to stick around in your county. Um, getting as many fall warblers as you can see in the two month period. So starting again September 1st through the end of October. And we uh, have a list that you can keep track of your warblers. Um, also the date and the place where you saw them. This is again the honor system. So you know if you're out at uh, Rocky River Reservation in the Cleveland Metro Parks, you're going to be able to uh, say, hey, on a certain date, I was at Rocky River Reservation and I saw this, 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 you can put little check marks or X marks on that sheet. So it's really, really, really easy. Um, there will be some prizes for people who see the most warblers throughout this challenge. And uh, this is, again, a friend raiser and a fundraiser for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. So we have that challenge going on. Tonight we have fall warbler identification, which will help you become a better birder at, at uh, identifying fall warblers. They're not confusing, right? Yeah, there might be a couple, but don't worry about that. Um, on the September 14th, Monday, there's going to be a, a, a presentation on fall warbler hotspots. So there's going to be at least three presenters that are going to tie in some areas where you can visit to see uh, good numbers of fall warblers coming in. Uh, on September 17th, which is a Thursday, and I think you can all see this on the slide that's in front of you, hopefully everybody has the slide. Um, Ryan Jacob will be back again, um, called, it's called The Place to Be, Ohio's Birding Network, a live broadcast. I, I believe that is going to be at Maubee Bay State Park. So that's going to be kind of cool, nine, 9 to 10 in the morning, so that's good. There will be an update uh, about mid-section of the, of the uh, challenge. So on Friday, October 2nd, again, we'll do the rah-rah, I'll be the cheerleader for getting people out, keep on going, you're doing great. Um, and we hope to have a couple of other programs uh, uh, coming up. You can see there's a couple to be determined. Uh, the Ball Warbler Research uh, Evening, Photography, and then on Saturday, November 14th, we will have a wrap up. What was seen, who saw it, where, who had the most. This is going to be fun. And if there's any people that took photos or videos, of uh, things that they couldn't identify. This is the time when we're going to be able to, to go through those as well. So it's a lot and it's going to make fall go very, very fast, but it's a lot of fun as well too. Again, it's making you a better birder 
that's what we're all about. And so I do want to, again, introduce uh, Ryan Jacob. He's a bird bander with Black Swamp Bird Observatory, an ornithologist, uh, naturalist, uh, punster. So he may be telling some jokes, and you may be like, uh, really? So I hope, I hope he does. So, so Ryan, please, we'd love to hear from you. I can't wait. All right, sorry, just switching over here a little bit. Thank you very much, Nancy. And all right, unfortunately, Betsy, <laughs> it happened again. It closed it out. So if you could send me the invite one more time, um, just trying to get the invite to share my screen. I know you all would love to just watch me and I can mime all these birds, but <laughs> probably not the best way. All right, let me. Yeah, we love technology. All right. See what I'm seeing? Yes. Fall warblers? Bueno. Okay. We're on the same page. Again, thank you very much, Nancy. Um, for those that don't know, me and Nancy kind of go back for a few years. We've been banding with each other for a good while, so I was super excited when she offered uh, us the opportunity to be able to talk about fall warblers. And the impression I got was that uh, we're going to go into a little bit more detail than just sort of a basic fall, war fall warbler review. So it's going to be a little bit more advanced, not crazy advanced, but getting down into the sort of nitty-gritty of some of these warblers. And it's a great time of year. I love this time of year. And I really hope you come away with the same appreciation that I have for warblers. Um, I think it's super cool that uh, Western Cuyahoga is putting on this fall warbler challenge, especially when we can't totally be together. This is a great way to still get outside and remind people that there's cool birds out there. So we're focusing in on warblers, and we all think of them in the spring. They're great. They have these awesome colors. Uh, they're bright, nice, contrasted. We love them. And then fall rolls around, and we're just kind of like, ah, what is that again? And we look at them with just utter confusion sometimes. And it doesn't have to be that confusing, except – if you're looking at the screen and you're looking at that bird on the right-hand side and you don't know what it is, it's actually a hybrid, Magnolia Red Star. Uh, I just used it, for example, to show how confusing some of these birds can be. There's not that many hybrids floating out there to confuse us, but it can be a little challenging at times. So what's the difficult part of this? We get these blocks in our head that they all look different than they do in the spring. And I think that scares a lot of people. And it's not necessarily true for all warblers. The other challenge with fall, again, that kind of drives people away, is there's all these leaves. In spring, we have the benefit of leaves just coming out, and in fall, we have all these mimic warblers, if you will. All these leaves clouding the trees, the warblers are moving in them, they all look green, they look the same. Sometimes you see a tail, sometimes you see a face, but you have all these blockages. So that can be a little challenging, uh, but as fall progresses, you know, leaves have to fall off trees. And when those leaves start to fall, the birds start to move lower, too. They fall as well and move into the lower vegetation levels where there's berries and other good, yummy morsels that will help put fat on their bodies. Uh, another challenge is birds don't often, warblers don't often sing in spring. They don't have a reason to. Males aren't defending a territory. Um, so they're not singing that often. I actually had a black pole the other day. I heard it on a point count, and I was like, there's a tinkling little fading black pole noise, and it caught me off guard, and then I saw it, and I was like, okay, it was a black pole. I wasn't making that up. So they do sing occasionally, but a lot of times they're just making chip notes, and they can be hard to differentiate sometimes. Some of them are pretty distinct, um, but if you can at least learn the sound of a warbler chip note, it's very beneficial to then finding where that sound is emanating from. Uh, if you can distinguish between a cardinal chip note and, you know, okay, that's a cardinal. I've seen 400 of those today. 
but that one's a warbler. I can go after that and try to find that bird. Um, that can be really beneficial to finding warblers, at least. And then the other problem that we run into in fall is that there's so many young birds. All these birds just bred. They had babies. They made eggs. Their kids are out. They're moving. Uh, the young outnumber the adults. They have to. That's how we keep the species moving. Um, and by the time they get to Ohio, especially northern Ohio, you know, not to be too morose about it, but there hasn't been that much mortality yet. Um, that a, can occur in other spots during migration. Um, so there's still a lot of young birds around, and they're the ones that are a little bit of the, the tricky ones of the bunch, but still not too bad. So with all those blockages in mind, um, there's still really great reasons to appreciate fall warblers, and I love incentives like this that get people out birding and looking at fall warblers because, again, we get these blockages of things we don't want to do because they're too hard. But if you take the time, and now's a really good time to take the time, um, you find great appreciation for them. So we can start dispelling some of these myths or some of these blockages. You know, not all of them look that different. Most of the warblers look the same as they do in spring, um, look the same as they do in spring as they do in fall. So it's really not that many that look different. And what I truly appreciate is the subtlety of all these birds. They're, they're not as brightly patterned as spring, so they're not eye-catching, but there's a lot of cool color gradations and variations and contrasts that are different than in spring. And really quick, if we think about spring, that's a bird's alternate plumage. That's what it looks like a just for a short time of the year. But in fall, birds are in their basic plumage. Uh, for younger birds, it's formative, but we'll just call it basic. And I think of that as what they basically look like all the time. So fall is a good time for us to really, uh, really take a look at the bird for who it is and not just appreciate it for the makeup that it puts on in spring to look pretty. And then you have a much longer migration period in fall. Spring, we're confined to you know, pretty much May, but, you know, for some species, it might be a week period, two-week period. But fall, we can have up to six weeks of certain species that are around um, from late August into October. Some of them are condensed still, but it's a much longer period to go out and look for birds, to appreciate nature, and to key into some of those ID um, points that separate the species. Other really cool thing is they travel in feeding flocks, so you can have birds that, you know, you have 15 birds fly into a tree in seven different species. And it's a cool time to, one, just see a lot of birds, but two, you can compare these birds next to each other and watch how they feed differently, how they move differently. And so it creates a nice opportunity for real observation and studying the behaviors of these birds. And the last thing that I appreciate about fall migration is, again, we're looking at young birds, and this is the first time they're traveling south. And for a lot of warblers, they're going all the way to South America, and they're only a few months old, five months old, no parents guiding them, just, you know, innate instinct, the stars, gravitational forces, and somehow they're going to get there, and each Blackburnian is going to go where Blackburnians go for the winter, and this is their first time doing it. I couldn't imagine me being a five-year-old and having to walk from Toledo to Cincinnati all by myself. And that doesn't even compare to going from the boreal forests of Canada down to Brazil. So it's a really neat time to think about the journeys they're undertaking and all the hardships they're going to encounter as they travel south. So as we start breaking down fall warblers. I'm going to be using consistent terms throughout the whole time um, and looking at certain portions of the species. Adult males of most species, they look the same pretty much in spring and fall. There's some exceptions, uh, but on the whole, they all look pretty similar as they do in spring. And for this, I'm assuming most people have a good understanding of male and female uh, warblers in spring. If you don't, I'll bring up some points 
um, that are key to them, or we can talk about it later. But just remember, males and male, adult males pretty much look the same. Um, young males and adult females, they look almost identical a lot of the times, and they look like the adult female would look like a female would look in spring. So they're pretty similar looking. Uh, we can see with this black Bernie, and you know, they all kind of just look like paler versions of each other. Our biggest issue with confusing ball warblers and who the some of the true confusing ones are are young females, and they're oftentimes much paler, don't have a lot of the same colors, a lot of the contrasts are gone. They just kind of look like these smooth birds, and they're the ones that are the head scratchers that you say I don't even know what that was. Um, so I'm going to be pointing them out a lot and talking about their distinguishing features. Just because you may see more of them, again, young birds are more prevalent, you may see more of them than the adults. Um, and I don't expect people to learn and to go out and go, oh, that's a adult male Blackburnian, that's a, a young male Blackburnian, and that's a young female. But at least if you have an idea of the fact that young females are paler or are the confusing ones, you can then go to your field guide and, you know, you had a very pale bird, you can skip past the adult males a lot of times and say, well, it wasn't that bird, but I can look here where it says immature or immature female and just compare between a few species that way. So you're kind of breaking things down to make identification easier. So the art of fall warblers and the WTF technique, and no, this isn't the, the technique from texting where you just are fed up with something, except sometimes with some warblers you do say WTF. But what this WTF is, is wing bars, uh, breaking down a bird that we see, wing bars are the first thing that's going to help us. And it's going to divide between wing bar Debbie. warblers and no wing bar warblers. The next features we're going to look at are throat and underparts. This could have just been underparts, but it didn't fit my acronym, so it had to be throat and underparts. Uh, and this is where we're going to look for some throat colors, breast streaking, things of that nature. And then the face, which is going to hold great characteristics that can differentiate between, you know, maybe it's this species, but it doesn't have a this. Maybe it's this species, but it doesn't have this facial marking. And I call this the art of fall warblers just because it feels like you're building an image in your head. You're taking all these components and putting a, a puzzle together to create this image, this picture, this painting of this bird to decide what species it is. So it's very aesthetically pleasing to me, but it's, a, it's, it's an art form. It's not just um, dry language. So the way that I've broken all of our warblers down, all, however many they are, 37 or so of the eastern warblers, is into warblers that don't change much, or warblers that don't change. These are birds that pretty much look the same in spring and fall. If you know what they look like in spring, you are ready for fall. Warblers that don't change much, if you know what they look like in spring, you're probably going to be able to identify them in fall. Uh, they look pretty similar. And then warblers that do change, so the ones that are significantly different than they are in fall. And this is sort of just my list. Uh, I don't know if there's any set in stone, like these are the ones that do this. Sort of is with molt and whatnot. Uh, but subjectively, I put some birds in places where I thought, eh, it doesn't change that much, or oh, it doesn't change at all. So if you have any problems with it, I'm sorry. It's my list, and we're just going to have to roll with it. So to begin with, we're going to start with the easy ones, warblers that don't change. And there's 14 of them. Hopefully my number is correct. There's 14 of them, and they look the same in spring as they do in fall. And you'll notice I've already divided these once again to five birds on the left side and nine birds on the right side. And the important note with this is those five birds, males and females, look the same. So already we can say, that's an oven bird. I don't need to know what sex it is. It's an oven bird in May. Looks the same as it does in September. Nothing changes about it. 
Um, the other thing you may notice going a little bit more advanced here, if you start to observe the way I've broken some of these down, a lot of these follow their genuses, their genera. Um, and those genera features follow over into the species. So let's go and get started. I'm not going to focus too long on birds that don't change much because there's no real reason to. Uh, so oven bird, tan body, looks like a thrush, white breast, great big black spots in that awesome orange crown, low skulker. Uh, they're great because they're pretty prevalent throughout most of fall migration. You're looking, they breed in the region, so about late August into mid-October, they'll be around. Worm-eating warbler, uh, not a very common warbler we'll see in fall. They're more of a southern warbler. Again, males and females look the same. No change in appearance. Um, olive -y sort of back, that nice cream face with a black eye line and black head stripe. Probably in a low skulker, the birds towards the ground. Probably not a bird we're going to encounter in fall. Um, again, more southerly species. They leave probably their breeding area July uh, by August at the latest. But you never know if one could show up. Our thrush warblers, the Louisiana northern. Louisiana, again, another more southerly species for us in Ohio, especially northern Ohio. Probably not going to see one. But you never know. Uh, again, males and females look the same. Uh, both the water thrushes are brown with light breasts and light bellies. For Louisiana, more whitish than it is uh, yellow, but let's just stick with white, white throat, white breast and belly, nice white eyebrow, supercilium uh, that kind of maintains its thickness, and a clear throat without spotting. Northern water thrush, on the other hand, the species you're going to probably encounter the most. Um, more tinged yellow, a little creamy to its lighter parts, and yellowy eyebrow eye line that kind of tapers back past the eye, heavily spotted throat. They're much more prevalent in fall, lasting August into October. And they're both species that you're going to find near water, typically. Migration birds can be anywhere, but these two prefer to be near water. Louisiana, more moving water. Northern water thrush, typically more stagnant, uh, still water, more marshy habitats. Yellow-throated warbler, again, probably not going to see it, but it's good to know what it looks like. Um, their breeder, we're more on their northern edge, so there's not that many around, and they depart pretty early. But there are some records from September, so you never know if one could show up. Um, Nice yellow throat, white belly with those cool black side streaks going down, and obvious black face patch, white eyebrow, and blue back. It's one of the only wing barred warblers. We can see it has wing bars. Um, with this, this pattern, one of the only wing barred warblers that males and females look the same. So you don't need to know what the difference is because there is no difference. And young birds pretty much look like adult birds. Now we start to get into birds that are going to be around um, and start to show differences. So I've, I've lumped all three of these together for kind of a reason, but we get into birds where males are pretty distinct and females, they just look like, you know, fainter versions of the male. Um, Golden-winged warbler, of course, with its nice big gold patch, gold crown. Males have a big old black face patch, black throat against the white belly. Females are just a paler version of this, kind of a gray face patch, grayish to lightish throat. Um, but she still has nice yellow wing patch, nice yellow crown. And this is a species that isn't that prevalent doesn't occur a whole, whole lot in fall. They leave pretty early, but they do move around in September, so they can be found. And young birds pretty much look like adult birds, so just knowing male and female and kind of that idea of what a golden wing looks like is good enough.
Blue-winged warbler, same way. Male, nice bright yellow, that nice black racing stripe through the eye. And blue wings with a yellow to white or white to yellow wing bar. Females, just sort of a paler version of this. Um, wing bar is not quite as prominent. Back a little bit duskier, wings not quite as blue. And that racing stripe is a little bit duller. But very slim sort of bird. And again, a breeder in the region, they depart pretty early, uh, usually in August, but they do still move around in September. But I wanted to put blue winged and prothonotary next to each other. Prothonotary, still with this group, female is just a little bit paler than the male. He's, of course, got that golden face and breast, bright green back, blue wings and tail with no wing bars. You can see hints of little bits of uh, edging to some of these wing coverts that are yellow, but it's not a wing bar. And transitioning from yellow into white underneath, they also have pale blue-gray legs. It's a good little distinguishing feature for prothonotary warbler. Uh, but females just a little bit paler than that. Their crowns are a little bit duskier green. Um, they have this very prominent dark eye that makes them look kind of bug-eyed on that bright yellow face or greenish face. But thinking about habitat, prothonotaries are more water, more marshy habitats, where our blue-winged warbler kind of looks similar, has bluish wings, it's yellow, uh, but they're going to be drier, scrubbier areas, so not really occupying the same habitats. And again, prothonotary, early departer, they rarely stick past, you know, the first week of September. So at this point, they're probably mostly all gone for the season. And we'll cry and wait for our golden swamp warblers to come back next year. Come on. My can oh. My computer apparently didn't want to go with the prothonotary. All right, Kentucky warbler. Again, southern bird. Probably not going to see it, but good to know. It's a green-backed warbler, plain green back, no wing bars, green back, green wings, yellow underneath, and the distinctive Elvis black sideburns going down from the eye, um, around the eye, and then down close to the ear patch. A, ground forager. You're going to often see them on the ground, pinkish legs, um, hiding out in the vegetation. We're, uh, we're pretty far of their range, uh, more southern Ohio, but you never know if they could show up. I think I figured out what my problem is between transitioning through slides. <clears throat> okay, black-throated blue warbler. Now we start to get into some that are a little, little tricky. Um, again, males and females look the same spring and fall, but males and females look different from each other. Males, probably the best-named warbler, black-throat, blueback, black-throated blue warbler. Distinctive, don't change uh, too much between spring and fall, just a little bit of pale flecking. But females don't look like males. They don't even look like a hint of males. The only hint they have is sometimes you can see a little white patch in the wings, their little white handkerchief that they hold on there. But unfortunately, some young girls don't have this patch, and you can't just look for that feature. Uh, it's never, it's usually not the best idea to go off of one feature anyway. So if we look at our female black-throated blue, kind of plain seafoam green, pale underneath, but if we can see that white wing patch, it's a good indicator. We look to, to, towards the face. She's kind of got a pale hairline eyebrow going over the eye, and then this light arc under the eye. So to me, I always kind of think she's put on her mascara. Um, helps me think of her, not to put genders onto anything, but makes me think of her as a female. Um, and you just kind of have to associate those two with each other. The wing patch definitely 
wing patch definitely helps with it being a black or a blue. And they're fairly common throughout fall migration in late August into early October, uh, predominantly September. Some of our last ones, I've put these three together for a particular reason. The male's pretty distinctive, hooded warbler male, nice black hood on his yellow body, green back, Wilson's warbler male, black cap, totally yellow underneath, nice vibrant yellow, and male yellow warbler, all yellow, not the green back of some of the other warblers, um, but if we could see his breast, he also has some of those rusty streaking and much more prominent dark eye on his face. But I wanted to point out the young girls because these can trip people up, I feel, um, just because they're yellow with a dark eye. Our female hooded warbler, if we compare her to the Wilson's warbler nearby, much longer, bigger bird, that eyeball looks so much bigger on her face, and we can just kind of see the hint of a cowl, a little hood around her. Uh, if we saw her tail open as well, we could see white spots in it. Hooded warbler, also a ground forager. If we go to Wilson's warbler, more petite looking, almost looks like it could be a bright yellow flycatcher. Um, so shorter, petite, doesn't spend its time on the ground. It's more mid-level, mid-level to a little bit higher. So that can help us figure out that it's a Wilson's. And then finally, we jump over to a young yellow warbler and could be male or female, so just yellow warbler. Um, but they're not really that yellow in fall, so we kind of have that benefit. They're more of a greeny sort of yellow, and that can point us towards a yellow warbler, but they're more of a mid-size if we look at these three species. Mid-size warbler, um, less olive in the back, and if you could see her tail, they usually have, they have ta yellow tail spots as well. And they're going to be in scrubbier habitat, mid-level, sometimes canopy if they're really adventurous. But if we look at the times, again, hooded, we're on the northern edge, probably not going to show up in fall, but you never know. Wilson's late August into September with a good peak, probably next weekish we'll be heading into Pete Wilson's time next week or so. And yellow warblers, uh, we don't think about it, but they're gone. They leave mostly in August, and they rarely stick around through September. For such a ubiquitous bird that's everywhere, they get out of Dodge very quickly. So you probably won't see a yellow warbler. But if you do, you can kind of know to look for some of those pale green-yellow birds that are probably young birds. And then finally, for the birds that don't change too much, Canada warbler. Um, a lot of people might not have trouble with this bird, but some, some do. But it's the only eastern warbler, at least, that has a plain slate blue-gray back head, or head, back, wings, and tail. No wing bars, just plain slate blue-gray. So that's a good indication right away. Males, adult males, don't change much. They have that great black necklace, very prominent eye ring with black and yellow bordering it. Uh, females and younger males, sort of a faint image of this. The black isn't as prominent, uh, but they still have that plain blue back, plain blue gray head and back, obvious eye ring with yellow in front of the eye going to the beak. Our issue comes down to these two females in the bottom. Again, plain gray, grayish green, uh, back head, or head, back, wings, and tail. Um, but no no really hint of a necklace, just barely a faint necklace. Sometimes it's not even a hint, it's just plain yellow. But they still have this nice eye ring that kind of switches between yellow and white, and then that yellow in front of the eye ring. They also depart fairly early. Got that part. Um, their peak was more so last week. They can still stick around into September, but they, they leave us a little early. Now, moving on to warblers that don't change much. Um, males are going to look pretty similar to how they look in spring. The biggest thing is going to be the young females that look different than the rest of the, the birds and the species. And going with knowing your taxonomy a little bit more, you'll start to notice that 
a good majority of these are Satasaga warblers, the former Dendroica, or if you will, the wing bar warblers. So a lot of these warblers have wing bars on them. So when you're looking at a bird and you say, ooh, it's got a wing bar, uh, you can go in your field guide and kind of get to that section where all the wing bar warblers are at. Black and white. Our favorite warbler, because it's monochromatic, it's black, it's white, done deal. Um, but they do have a little bit added color to them sometimes in the fall. And we don't think about it, but males, in spring they have a nice black throat, but our bird up in the left, he doesn't really have a black throat. They sort of lose that black throat, but we can still see he's just plain old black and white, pre-color TV, and really nice contrasted stripes along the sides, two great white wing bars. Our birds on the right, um, not as many black features in the face, but they're still just black and white. White underneath, um, black in the wings. The wings are black, two white wing bars. Some of these birds, the black on the sides isn't as prominent. It's a little bit blurry. There might be a little bit of peach mixed in there. So just sort of sepia TV before True Color TV was out. Uh, but they're pretty much just black and white, white eyebrow, supercilium, um, and a black line leading behind the eye. And the other great feature of black and whites, even if you just see their butt, they have a speckled butt underneath. And they're the only warbler that has these nice black spots in the undertail covert. So if you're confused and frustrated and there's leaves in the way and all you see is that butt with those speckles, you can at least say it's a black and white. And they're pretty common, or at least prevalent, throughout fall migration. So late August into early October, again, September being our time frame. We get to Tennessee the first of the true confusing fall warblers. And they're fairly plain. Males, such as the middle bird on the left side and maybe the top bird, um, bluish gray, green head, green back and wings, light underneath. Not too many distinctive features on these birds. Younger birds and females, they're just, these are the ones that trip people up. They're just plain green yellow. They look like all the other leaves in the cottonwood or in the maple, just green yellow birds. But it's a smooth green yellow. There's no interruptions with streaks and uh, blurriness at all. Even in the back, there's no streaks. The only really good feature we have is this dark eye line with a pale eyebrow above it. So in the male, this is kind of a nice white eyebrow in younger birds and females, sort of just a pale area. So we have this dark eye line with a pale eyebrow. And even though they're not a wing bar warbler, you will see occasionally some of the wing coverts get these little pale tips to them. And it'll almost look like a wing bar, but it's not truly a wing bar. Um, so don't get tripped up on one feature. And timing-wise, they are prevalent through most of migration. Uh, their heaviest movements towards the end of September, but we've been seeing them since late August, and they'll go well into, or at least start tapering off by mid-October. And they're a bird um, of the canopy. They'll move lower, but predominantly they like to be in the canopy. Their antithesis, or at least their rival, maybe not antithesis, but their rival is the orange crown warbler, the, the warbler everybody mixes them up with. And at least in my eyes, they're starkly different. Um, out in the wild, it can be a little bit harder when you have green leaves shining green light on everything. But if we start looking at orange crowns, they're much grayer, especially in fall. Spring, they're a little bit more yellow fall they take on this gray characteristic again not too many character distinctive characteristics going on we have this grayish hood um, grayish throat that leads into sort of a blurry yellow breast and yellow underparts greenish back green wings fairly plain bird we look at the face sort of a little bit a hint of an eye line but this bird has eye arcs, almost an eye ring, setting its face apart from something like a Tennessee. 
and they're one of our later moving migrants. They're not that common in the East to begin with, um, fall migration even less so, and they're moving the end of September into October, predominantly October. So because they're a confusing pair, let's just compare these two together. We have our Tennessee on the left. We look at this bird, very thin, uh, very pointy looking in my eyes, but it's just this smooth green yellow bird. And I don't like to focus too much on undertail coverts um, because that color can be drastically altered by the surrounding vegetation. But if you have good light, um, white undertail coverts on a Tennessee. Orange crown warbler, more rounded, uh, stouter bird, still kind of a pointy beak like a Tennessee, but doesn't have as obvious of an eye line because of those blurry streaks on the breast. It kind of looks dirty, like it just kind of rolled in a little bit of dirt. It was looking for a larva on the ground and went a little too far down. So it kind of has this messy, dirty looking appearance on the breast and the belly, but completely yellow underneath, uh, yellow to its undertail. Not bright yellow, but consistently yellow through underneath. And I mentioned timing again, because it can be very important. Um, timing doesn't eliminate things, but it can certainly help. So if you're in September and you see a yellowish pointy beaked bird with no wing bars, and you're not sure if it's a Tennessee or an orange crowned. Knowing their timing, it's probably a Tennessee. Doesn't rule out that it's an orange crown, but if we look at our graphs down here, Tennessee much more common in September. We move over to orange crown. Its peaks are more in the middle of October, going into October. Orange crowns are even known to overwinter sometimes or last well into December. So it's a much later moving bird, and by the time its peak rolls around, Tennessee has already departed the region for the most part. Um, these are BSBO's graphs, Black Small Bird Observatory's graphs, that we've generated. You can find those on our website. This is also something you can do on eBird as well if you'd like to look for timing graphs on that source. Okay. Moving on to different green-backed warblers, Nashville warbler. Males, again, not too different, a little bit paler than they are in spring, but grayish hood with a pale throat, um, green back, green wings, yellow underneath. The most obvious feature on a Nashville is that bright white eye ring. If we could see its crown, it would have a little bit of rufous in there as well, but... We don't, they don't like to let us see that crown too often. But a very petite bird, generally mid-habitat to, to canopy, and they've just kind of started moving. They're more early September going into early October, but next couple of weeks should be their peak time in at least in northern Ohio. And it's a species that could be confused with Connecticut warbler. Again, gray hood, very prominent eye ring, greenish back, yellow underneath. So looking just specifically at Connecticut, though, we can see for the male that hood encompasses the whole face, throat, and upper breast. After that, it's just all yellow underneath. Younger birds and some females, they're a shade of what the adult male is, more of a tan gray hood that just gradually transcends and, or gradually uh, goes into this yellow lower breast and yellow belly. Compared to a Nashville, they're a stalker of the floor. They're a ground stalker, dense vegetation. You're not going to see them typically at eye level, definitely not in the canopy. And while they are a sought after bird that we don't think exists sometimes. They're predominantly moving in September. Another kind of look alike with the green backed warblers, morning warbler. Male, again, doesn't look too different than he does in spring. Blue gray hood, black breast patch, just a little bit paler than spring. Females down in the lower left corner, or at least adult female, 
gray hood, kind of like a Connecticut, if you will. But she doesn't have that obvious eye ring, um, just a yellow breast, no wing bars, of course, because she's a green-backed warbler. Our real trouble comes with some of the young morning warblers, the two birds to the right. And they're very nondescript birds. We can look at them. They're sort of a tan gray hood, pale throat that kind of seamlessly blends into just a yellow breast and belly. Um, and just a hint, more than a hint of an eye ring, could be eye arcs, uh, but definitely this pale area surrounding the eye and what could look like almost a face patch, if you will. So comparing these three together, our natural is kind of like the coupe of the of the models. If we're going to we're going to Ford to pick us up a green-backed warbler, and Nashville's very petite, tiny compared to the other two greenbacks, and they're up in the trees, they're up in the canopy. You're not going to see them down on the ground unless they found a caterpillar that is just too good to turn away from. Uh, but much pointier, thinner bill. Again, that hood, for younger birds at least, can almost blend right into the throat, so there's not that much of a difference uh, making them almost look like a Connecticut, but it usually stands out pretty well from the throat and the back colors. Connecticut, our full-size warbler, spends its time on the ground. It's a hefty bird, pretty round in shape, um, has a tendency to walk. I don't think I've ever seen a Nashville warbler walk. I think I've seen a morning warbler walk. Um, but a ground stalker, very prominent eye ring, and its hood is there, but it also, again, kind of compared to the Nashville, just kind of seamlessly blends into that yellow belly and yellow undertail. Something else to note, um, it's hard to tell in a Banders photo, but on our Nashville, its vent is white. So not the undertail, not the belly, but the vent where the cloaca is. That's a white spot. Hard to, it can be hard to see it, but... It at least differentiates it from Connecticut warbler if either of the two were to meet somewhere in the vegetation together. And then finally, our mid-size model, um, brand new for 2021. They just released it. The young morning warbler. More so compared to the Connecticut, they're often confused for each other. Uh, its eye ring isn't as prominent. It's kind of broken a little bit. And it doesn't have that all-encompassing hood. You can see it kind of ends. There's sort of a line that comes down from the beak going towards the back that separates the face from a palish throat. So it has pale white to yellow, pale yellow um, throat that kind of goes then into the yellow of the breast and underneath. And the last of our greenbacks is the common yellow throat. You'll probably see one because they're pretty common. Um, they have that name for a good reason. But males, again, I don't know how many times, I'm, I'm probably going to say it for every single species. Males look like they do in spring for the most part. Just a little tiny bit of fleck in that black face patch that distinguishes them. That nice bright yellow throat, tannish olive. Uh, compared to some of the other quote-unquote greenback warblers. We start getting confused with our young birds, and I've seen a lot of people tripped up on common yellow throats because, again, they're kind of indistinct. But we can see they have at least a yellow throat that stands out against a tan face. So no face facial markings, plain face um, that's just mostly tan, brown, little hints of olive, but it contrasts with that yellowish throat. And it can be bright yellow sometimes, but a lot of times in the females and younger birds, it's a pale yellow. But compared to something like a morning, it sort of stops at the breast. And then the rest of the underbelly, or the underside of the bird, the belly, is just a tan cream color. And Although this is a bird, mostly prefers marsh habitat, but they're pretty 
uh, non-choosy in where they'll go. They'll go to forest edges if they have to, um, get into some of the shrub scrub, but a, a lower bird in the vegetation. And again, they're common. They are real common in fall with lots of young moving around, and they're prevalent mid-August, well, actually all of August, um, well into mid-October, if not sometimes late October. And one other note, uh, occasionally, I see this a lot of times on photo pro or photo websites and whatnot, people will say, oh, that's a young male, uh, common yellow throat, and it looks like this bird in the, the lower center. And that could be a male or female. Unless it has some black flecks in the face, like the bird in the lower right corner, um, that would be a young male. But if it doesn't have any of that, we don't know. You just have to say it's a, a female-like, female-type common yellow throat. So again, to kind of compare these two, fairly plain, green backs, green wings, um, common yellow throat tends to be a little bit browner than young morning warbler, young morning on the left. I have to be honest, the first time I saw this photo, I had a WTF moment, and I didn't know what that bird was. It confused me. And then I pieced it out, and I was like, okay, that's a, that's a young morning warbler. Um, but we can see that sort of hint of an eye ring on that bird, more of a gray hood, and again, totally yellow underneath, where if we look at our common yellow throat to the right, uh, much browner, tanner, the yellow isn't very prominent in the throat, and it kind of just ends at the breast, and the rest of the underbelly or the underside is just a tan, creamish sort of color. Moving into our Cetaphaga, our wing-barred warblers. Our greatest Halloween bird, the American Red Star, starts us off, because the start is anything. And males, again, don't look that much different than they do in spring. They're black and orange. You see a black and orange little warbler, we know it's an adult male, American Red Star. But our young and our females, not black at all. But they have the same accents, for the most part, that a, that a male does. So looking at our bird in the lower left corner, we can see she's got, it has, they have, orange-yellow wing pits or pit stains. Um, an orange-yellow bar in the wing, and orange-yellow bar in the tail. And I just want to keep saying orange-yellow because it's not always orange. Sometimes it's yellow, such as the other two birds to the in the middle. Um, other than that, they're fairly plain. No real distinctive features except when we start to look at sort of color and pattern on them. Um, they have a grayish hood that contrasts with a slightly duller, more green back. So it creates the appearance of a hood, slight eye ring appearance, and then just plain underneath, just light white, um, white gray underneath. So not too many features other than these yellow-orange spots, but even just seeing the head, um, should, is a good indicator of a, an American red star, just that light gray with a white throat. Nobody else kind of really looks like that. And their peak time is September, for like most of the fall warblers. Kirtland's warbler, honestly, I forgot about Kirtland's warbler and had to add it in at the last second because it's not a bird I think about because they're just not that common. Um, so not probably going to encounter them, but it's good to always know what they look like, and hopefully you find one in fall or spring, and that would be great. Um, but for our wing-barred warblers, they don't actually have really wing bars. So it kind of separates them from some of the other, quote-unquote, wing-barred warblers. But males, blue-gray top um, with nice prominent white eye arcs, yellow throat that extends all the way through the breast belly and leads to a white undertail, and just hints of black streaking um, on the sides, typically none across the breast. Younger birds 
maybe. Um, but females, just sort of a paler version of this. Not quite blue, just more dusky, dusky gray. But they still have good eye arcs. Um, yellow from throat down to the undertail with black spots going along the sides and across the breast. So for our wingbard warblers, nobody else really is yellow completely all the way underneath. So that's, at least in fall, good indication um, of Kirtland's most of the time. Not always. And again, breeding up in Michigan and Ontario, they depart very early, not typically encountered in fall. Um, there's so few of them, we barely see them in spring. But good to know what they look like. Oh, another note, very robust, rounded kind of bird. Much more heftier than something like a Cape May warbler. Speaking of Cape May warbler, our tiger warbler, the tiger the true tiger king. Um, males. Awesome looking. I switched it up, Nancy. Awesome looking with this wonderful yellow um, face and breast. Great chestnut cheek patch and great tiger stripes going down the breast and into the belly. Look like they do in spring. Then we get our younger birds. Kind of hints of, hints of this bird. So some of these younger birds and the male and uh, adult female can have yellow in them, um, but still hold on to those black breast streaks. Uh, some of them very prominent, like the bird in the lower left. Some of them not so prominent, like the bird in the top right and especially the bird in the lower right. But looking at them, some of them we can see, okay, there's kind of an eye line a little bit of a cheek patch, and we can sort of see this pale area wrapping up around uh, that cheek patch coming up from the neck. But if, as we move over to our paler, grayer birds, a little bit hard to tell some of those facial features. Pale area on the neck, not very obvious. Um, but those streaks are still kind of there. If we look in the wings, the wing bars aren't very prominent, kind of little specks of white through them, but mostly green, greenish wings. Compared to some of the other warblers, though, if you look at their beak, it almost has a down, it's almost curved down a little bit. It's very petite um, and just gives them a looking down sort of appearance. But they're here now start showing up in late August, but really start moving in September, going into October. Northern Perula has all the colors. If you look for a color, it would be on a Perula just about. Males with blue uh, heads and wings, green back patch, great yellow throat, sometimes some rust on there, and beautiful white eye arcs. Younger birds, females, uh, more greenish blue in the head um, and the wings, but still pretty blue. But they have that yellow throat and yellow breast that, or yellow that ends at the breast and then white underneath. Still have a green patch on the back. And another, th another good thing to note is they have a bicolored bill. So yellow on the bottom, black on the top. And they're not as common in fall. Uh, they're canopy foragers. And a lot of times they're moving in September into early October. Everyone's favorite, Blackburnian, the Cheeto-faced warbler. Males still hold on to some of that bright orange from spring, but they have those black features still, that burnt black triangle coming off the face, black crown. Our young male and adult female, uh, young male down in the lower left, adult female up in the upper right, kind of an orange-yellow face. Some of those black streaks aren't as prominent, but we can still see two good-sized wing bars on them and more of a brown back, but they still have that black face triangle. Very nice distinctive feature, at least for those three of the Blackburnian Warbler. Our young females, though, in the center and the lower right, 
they're one of the ones you could look past and go, I don't know what that was. Very desaturated version and uncon uncontrasted, uh, lower contrasted version of the other black burning warblers, but still kind of have that hint of a cheek patch with a pale orange to yellow eyebrow, supercilium, orange yellow throat, and somewhat orange yellow breast with smudgy streaks on it. And they're moving late August into early October. Pine warbler, the plainest of the warblers, I, I hate to say it, but they're just, they're plain. If you see a plain warbler, it's probably a pine warbler. Males can hold on to a lot of that yellow, but for the most part, um, it kind of subsides in spring or fall a little bit. The younger birds and females have wing bars, have a wing bar, but other than that, not too many other features, really plain, kind of show some eye arcs um, a little bit. Um, dusky sort of brownish back, no real streaks at all. And their numbers stay pretty low in fall, not too many of them around, and they kind of can move throughout all of August, August um, into October. But um, another note, just very stocky, rounded bird, thick bill, and as their name suggests, they do prefer being in pine trees. Doesn't mean they have to be, but a lot of times that is where you will find them. Black-throated green. Males lose a little bit of that black in fall, or at least the, uh, the adult males, that is. Uh, it's tipped with some white feathers, so it can look a little, little dusky, but it still looks black. But our other uh, black-throated greens, they don't really have that black throat. They look more like the spring female does with just kind of a yellowish-white throat. Um, but looking at their face, nice yellow eyebrow, um, lower malar area, and then this dusky olive cheek patch coming out from behind the eye. All that bordered by sort of a green olive back and green olive top. But after the throat, it's just a plain white, mostly white breast and belly, some of them showing dark black streaks bordering the throat, um, just below the throat, and going down the sides a little bit. Great wing bars on them, very prominent usually, and contrasting really well that black and gray wing with nice green back. And they've just kind of started moving, so they're, they're primarily late August, mostly early September, and kind of fade off towards early October. And then I saved these two for last, just because they change a little bit, but we're also not probably going to see them. Again, good to note that they could be around, but Cerulean, you know, a limited breeder in the region, typically leaves by July, in July. Um, so probably not going to see them now in September. But males, obvious with that blue face against that white throat, blue back, white breast with sort of these blue-black stripes going down the sides. And then young birds and females, kind of a blue, seafoam blue-green uh, top and back can kind of vary into a yellowish spectrum, a green-yellow spectrum. And then just plain yellow-white throat and breast, with kind of some hints of some streaks. But their face is pretty distinctive with a real dark eye line and hint of a pale supercilium going over that prairie um, great black arc under the eye, which is also under a yellow arc under the eye, and completely yellow underneath. And even though it's a wing barred warbler, which tend to have white wing bars, it actually has yellowish wing bars. And they're not always that prominent, but if you can kind of see those yellow wing bars, it might be a prairie warbler. The young birds, females, just, a, again, a shade of what the, the male looks like. So just a hint of that black arc under the eye, little tiny black line going through the eye, and just little black stripes going down that yellow breast and yellow sides. And another early departer, we're on sort of the northern fringe of their range, 
So probably not going to encounter them in fall, but you never know. All right, and lastly, we move to only six. There are only six, and it's probably actually only five, but I consider it six, birds that change. They look different than they do in spring. They're confusing, but they're not that confusing. Magnolia being the first big changer. If we look at how he looks in the top left corner, you know, gray-blue crown, black face, black neck, uh, black necklace. We look at all those other birds. Yeah, they kind of, kind of have some of those patterns, uh, but not totally. Um, one of the greatest features, though, of Magnolia before getting into other features is that white tail band, that band going through the middle of the tail that makes it look like the end of the tail was dipped in black ink. No other warbler has that, at least in the east. It has a great identifier, even if you just see like that bird in the lower or in the middle, low middle, uh, the white towards the white undertail, magnolia warbler. But compared to spring, kind of have a gray, grayish hood against a yellow throat. Um, they kind of actually hold on to a little bit of that black necklace line, but it turns sort of a gray white. You'll see that a lot of times dividing the throat from the breast and belly. But yellow breast and belly, the black streaks aren't as prominent now in fall, if even there at all. And you get some of these birds that turn very pale and don't have the darkest gray hood. It's just kind of this light uh, color in between, but at least contrasts with a green back still, green brownish back. And Again, another wing barred warbler still shows pretty good wing bars. You can take those features and start looking in that section. And nice eye ring on these birds. Typically white, but can be a little creamy colored sometimes. Um, and they're pretty prominent September into October. Our biggest changer, one of our biggest changers, bay breasted warbler. We lose all our chestnut, we lose all our black. Some males will hold on to a little bit of chestnut on the flanks. Not that many, or at least the younger birds and females don't have that feature for the most part. But looking at the green color on them, they have this green, like electric green almost, uh, head and face that transitioned in, transitions into this creamy white, or yeah, creamy white um, sort of throat, breast, and belly. And it just, to me, it always seemed like a watercolor painting. Just a kind of picture, well, even though he didn't use watercolors, Bob Ross just smoothly taking his palette knife and pulling this green through the bird, maybe throwing in a little happy wing bar down at the end. Um, but it's just a smooth-looking warbler to me. They are a little bit stout. That beak is kind of thick-looking. Um, the wings kind of a dark gray color. If we look at the edges on them, they're mostly gray. So it's kind of this green gray sort of bird. And another good feature for them are the legs, which are kind of a pale blue gray or blue gray, almost purple hue to them. But no streaks underneath, just plain um, August into October, predominantly again, September. Its competitor for the most confusing warbler, the black pole warbler. No longer black. No longer does it have its pole on the top of its head. It doesn't look like a chickadee anymore. It's just kind of an olive green, olive green bird. The the yellow of the head has. It's not yellow like some of the other yellow birds. It's not bright lime green in a way like the bay breast. It's just sort of this dusky olive yellow color. And you get some birds, like in the lower left, uh, that have black peppering throughout the bird. So that's a little good way you see that olive with black flecks in it. Um, it's a good indication of a black pole warbler. But a lot of times you get these other birds that are just kind of green-yellow, olive-yellow, and don't seem like they have features. But if we look at their faces, 
they kind of show a little bit of an eye line, a little bit of a pale soup, uh, eyebrow above the eye and the eye line, little bit of a dusky breast. We can kind of see where there's hints of streaks on them, uh, streaks in the back as well. But no, it, it all stays this kind of olive yellow color. And that yellow, compared to like the bay breast, goes through the throat a lot of times and into the breast, where bay breast it doesn't really go that far. Another feature that separates black pole from bay breast is their legs. They have brownish legs with yellow feet. We could call them, and I call them a lot, snowy black poles or um, snowy poles. And they're one of our most prominent warblers in fall. Usually if you see something, a lot of times it's going to be a black pole moving at various layers throughout the vegetation. Um, we're along the Lake Erie coast in their migration pathways. They head over to the east coast. So expect to see them a lot. It's a great opportunity to learn their chip notes as well because they do like to chip quite a bit. Um, and moving September into mid-October, Comparing these two, because again, these are the two that are confused the most. Bay breast on the left, very smooth, green looking bird, electric green kind of, um, but no breast streaks, just a nice, smooth, happy transition from that pale throat through the breast into this creamy color underneath. And again, wings kind of giving this. Um, image of just black and gray. And again, those sort of pale blue-gray legs that are just one color through uh, the tarsus, the, the leg bone we can see going into the, the toes, just all one uniform color. Black pole on the right, they like to stay like that, kind of hidden, um, at least when I'm photographing them. But again, it's, it's more of an olive yellow color, and they tend to have more black peppered. Uh, this bird happens to have a little bit of black above the eye, a little bit in the bottom of the throat. But we can see hints of dusky breast streaks um, against that yellow. Again, bay breast, that breast area would probably just be more of a cream, um, or if it was any color, it would be more of that green, limey yellow. And in their wings, it gives the impression more of olive black wings. And we can see that better with the black pole on the right. The wing feathers, the covert feathers in the wing, edged in olive green. So gives you this impression of black and green, where bay breast on the left most of its covert feathers, at least, um, are edged in gray. Even the, the shoulder, the lesser coverts of the bird, are more gray than they are olive. So just this black-gray, uh, cooler-looking, cooler as in temperature cooler, I guess, um, looking bird, and it matches well with those pale blue-gray uh, legs and feet, and another close-up of the black pole's leg and feet in the right corner, dark brownish sort of tarsus with yellow snowy egret-like foot pads. And looking at our center birds, we have a bay breast on the left and a black pole on the right. You can kind of see that yellow definitely extending well more into the breast of the black pole, going much farther than the throat, and little streaks festooned throughout it. Um, just kind of gives it a little bit of a dirty, I say dirty, it's just the word that comes to mind, dirty appearance, like it put its breast down a little bit too far. Chestnut, one that people confuse, I don't know how though, um, I think because they just can't believe it looks so different than it does in spring. But they lose that black. Uh, they lose the yellow, at least, in the crown. And that white turns to gray. That white throat, white uh, in the face, turns to gray. And a lot of them, unless they're an adult male, don't have the chestnut on the sides. So 
our bird, top bird in the center, does have chestnut, probably an adult male. Uh, gray face, nice bright white eye ring, and it's a very limey, uh, green limey bird on top through the crown, going into the neck, going into the back, this electric-y, limey green color. And if we look in the wing coverts as well, the wing bar there is also kind of um, edged in that limey green color too. But for the birds that don't have that chestnut, that yellow-green top carries, just like the male, yellow-green forehead into the crown, neck, and leading into the back, all contrasting with this pale gray face that goes into a smooth, smoothlessly transitions into a gray-white breast, but that prominent eye ring is still there. Moving late August eh, into sep mid-September, start to peter off at the end of September. Yellow rumped warblers, and you'll have to excuse me if I just call them myrtle warblers. I can't help it. Um, but yellow rumped warblers lose the blue and black that we know them for in spring and turn to kind of just these brown warblers. Sometimes they maintain those yellow wing pits, the yellow rump. Um, but some of them don't show those yellow wing pits as often. Uh, the young females don't really show them. And for yellow rumped birds, they're not the only bur uh, warbler with a yellow rump. Sorry, yellow rump, but magnolias have it too, and so do Cape Mays and Palms. Um, but it is, a, it is a feature to add to the list of what makes a myrtle a myrtle, or sorry, what makes a yellow rump a yellow rump. But looking at them, no real good facial pattern. Um, really the only thing going on in the face is they have these white eye arcs a feature they carry over from spring. Um, just kind of a dusky brown face patch. A little pale above it, but not, not really too much. Um, but it does at least kind of contrast with a pale throat that goes into a uniform white tan uh, throat, breast, and underparts leading just to white. And we can see just a little bit of black streaking in the breast. Not too much. Um, depending on the age and the sex of the bird. But it does create a streaky look when you look at them underneath. And a lot of times they can have very prominent black streaks in the back. Sometimes they can just be kind of brown, but usually you'll see that yellow rump with them as well. And they're predominantly an October bird, moving mid-October into the peak in mid-October into November. And lastly, palm. I don't know if people, a lot of people probably wouldn't consider palm warbler one that changes. I do just because it goes from being a plain yellow and chestnut warbler to being a plain brown and tan warbler. So there, there's a little bit of difference there. Uh, but they're, they're very, very plain. Just brown throughout the top. Really no wing bars, even though they're in the wing barred warblers. Um, their face, kind of a hint of a dusky eye line, but they at least have this great pale eyebrow above it, and that kind of matches the yellow eyebrow that they'll have in spring. Uh, males and females looking the same, no way to really tell the difference. And that at least brown face, kind of like the myrtle or the yellow rump, contrasts with a tan white throat. You can kind of make out a little bit of a maler stripe as well. Uh, but the breast is really just tan, no yellow. It has sort of these streaks of brown intermixed in them. And then they are a yellow rumped warbler. They have a, an olive, olive rump um, and then yellow undertail coverts as well. They're one you're going to find near the ground usually. Mid-level a lot of times too, but they like being near the ground and moving you know, late September into mid-October. And for a last comparison, because I feel like these four are nice to compare to each other, um, they can be some of our plainest warblers. So pine warbler in the top left compared to 
Cape May warbler in the bottom left, both just kind of gray birds. Um, they both can kind of have an affinity for pines. But if we look at them, that pale pine, mostly just gray, no, really no other colors in it. Uh, they typically have two wing bars that are noticeable, but it's a chunky bird, stout bird, really rounded head. And the Cape May warbler, if it doesn't have those nice tiger stripes going down the breast uh, and leading into the belly, it has a greener look, at least in the wings. Sometimes they won't have yellow on them, um, like we would lo hope to look for. But there is at least more of an olive tone in the wings and the wing coverts, and they don't always show a great white wing bar. And if they do, it can kind of have some greens mixed into it. But compared to the pine, a, a more petite bird, more slender. Again, that bill is kind of thinner and almost hooked down, uh, curved down in a way. And then also much more common than pines are going to be. A yellow rump, if you could see it, where pine, just plain sort of gray. And then yellow rump compared to palm, both sort of brown um, fall warblers. But looking at them, one of the obvious things is yellow rump has eye arcs that are nice and white, nice white wing bars. Palm lacks these features. Palm has no eye arcs, has no wing bars. Palm has a pale eyebrow going over its eye. Myrtle, or sorry, yellow rump lacks this feature. Um, and yellow rumps just tend to be a little, little streakier, uh, in my opinion. I think it probably varies just depending on the individual. But again, their habits will help inform which one it is as well. If it's low on the ground, if it's mid to canopy, uh, low on the ground being palm, higher mid to canopy being the, the yellow rumped warbler. And if we were able to see their rumps, yellow rump would have that brighter yellow um, rump, and palm would have that, let's just say oleo, that paler green, maybe fake butter, uh, butter butt, if you will, yellow rump. I don't know if you knew it, but that was 37 warblers. <laughs> In the that eastern was, United States, minus Swainson's warbler. <laughs> that was um, fabulous. Oh, fabulous. But it's a, it's a group I really like. I hope um, it wasn't too scary. You were able to pull some good features for some of them. And again, it comes down to patterns and, yeah, just spending the time with the birds. So on that note... Questions, thoughts, concerns. Yeah. Yeah. I also do poll. If anybody reading. has a question, yep. if there anybody has a question, uh, toss it into the chat. Or you can unmute yourself now that Ryan is needs a, a breather. <laughs> got yourself a glass of wine there? Uh, no, I have um, my, my nice water bottle. Water, okay. Um, if, yeah, you can unmute yourself. Maybe pose a question. Um, directly that would be lovely too uh, I, I know I was jotting down some things even though I've seen a lot of these birds a lot um, just always good information uh, and you can never so, see enough of them and you know the photos you have of course are in hand the ones like you say are in the field you got the color of the leaves coming through you got poor lighting you got ah. so yeah but it's so fun. I meant to I apologize. Love, I, love I forgot. Um, most of my photos are banding photos because for the past 10 years or so, every migration I spend in the field banding birds, and it took a pandemic for me to finally be able to get out and photograph fall birds. So for the past two weeks, that's what I've been trying to do. And, of course, it's been raining for three or four days now. Um, so from Drina, Neens, where are good places to go? I unfortunately am not a Clevelander, Cuyahoga, Lorraine, Medina person, so I don't particularly know. I could tell you Northwest Ohio, um, of course, McGee Marsh, um, Maumee Bay State Park, Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge being great places. 
Um, I, I can say, though, for fall, if you're on the lake shore, a lot of times um, if you get a south wind, that can be nice sometimes because it can push birds back up to the lake shore. If it's a south wind um, or maybe in that area more of a southeast wind kind of going perpendicular to the lake shore. Um, but it can be good to go a mile or so in because birds will descend down compared to how they do in spring, which is come in, then go up. So moving a little bit farther inland can produce some good results. Yeah. Uh, Drina, the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve is good. Uh, Wendy Park can potentially be good. There's not a whole lot of undergrowth there. Uh, just about any of the Cleveland Metro Parks. Um, again, there's just lots of different habitats. Oh, gosh, I'm just trying to think. And I don't know where you live, uh, Drina, so uh, if you want to go outside of Cuyahoga County, there's, uh, you know, places in Lorain County. I'm just, oh, my gosh, I can't think of the marshland area. Um, Betsy, you've been there. Oh, my gosh, I'm losing my mind here. Um, yeah, so, so. Again, not yeah. knowing specific areas, I would recommend places you can find. Um, forests are great, but they're hard to see stuff in the canopy. Um, so finding areas that have adjacent forest with some shrub scrub, uh, maybe dogwoods, other fruiting trees. Fields aren't great for finding migrating warblers. Uh, but if you can get to some of those areas on the edges of forests, uh, birds will tend to move a little bit lower and more in eye view, or they'll be going to the nearby canopies. Um, so finding areas like that, areas adjacent to marshes as well, that'll have a healthy supply of insects ready to bite at least us, maybe <laughs> bitten by others. Any other questions? All right, well, um, again, we want to thank Ryan. That was, oh, again, fabulous. I, I saw the nice way that he put them together. They don't change. They change a little, and they, then the ones that change a lot. Uh, but we want you to be able to get out to be in our Fall Warbler Challenge. Uh, challenge yourself. Go out with a friend. Of course, please uh, always remind yourself that not in large groups. Uh, I'll you know, take all the COVID precautions. Uh, wear a mask. Stay at least six feet apart, that type of stuff. And if you are going out, um, but, you know, have fun. And... Um, Really, again, this is a challenge. Try your luck. There are good resources out there. As a matter of fact, I think Black Swamp has some little quizzes periodically. I know they just had a warbler quiz the other day. Uh, they've had quizzes on shorebirds, uh, raptors, thrushes, that type of thing. So, so that, that's kind of fun to, to again, mm -hmm. try, your, try your luck. And then, of course, sign up. May I add something? Oh, uh, yes. This is Nancy in Virginia. Um, I know I'm not in oh, Ohio, wonderful. but I mm -hmm. saw your link on our local Audubon uh, website, and I want to tell you how much I enjoyed this, and I learned a great deal. And before you spoke, they all really did look very much alike. So now I have something to help me distinguish a bit better so thank you so very much for your presentation. It was marvelous. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Nancy. And I'll be honest, they actually all were the same bird. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Ross just put those happy little colors on them. <laughs> all righty. Well, again, thank you so much. And we'll look forward to some of you joining in or all of you joining in on Monday with the birding uh, hotspots, the fall warbler hotspots. And uh, again, get out there and bird. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>